Previously on this channel, we have discussed the uniforms of the various ranks within the British Army during the late 18th century, and we have discussed how to distinguish an enlisted man from a corporal, a corporal from a sergeant, and a sergeant from a commissioned officer. But what do those ranks actually do? What are the individual duties and responsibilities of, say, a corporal, and how might they differ from the duties and responsibilities of a sergeant? And how might a sergeant's duties differ from an ensign's, or a lieutenant's, or a captain's, or a major's, or a lieutenant colonel's, or what have you? Well, there's two ways to answer this question. I can answer it from a reenactor's perspective, and I can answer it from an actual historical perspective, because there's some differences between the two. Not dramatic differences, but differences nonetheless. So it might be good to spend some time going over what those differences are before we get into the real meat of this discussion. We'll start with reenacting first. As the sergeant of a reenacting unit, I am basically the Pied Piper. I am in charge of leading the men into battle. Working under the command of a higher ranking officer, I tell the rest of the men when and where to march, in what direction to face, when to load and fire their weapons, and in what direction to fire them. Additionally, I am in charge of keeping the men in formation should any of them get out of line. Off the field, I am also in charge of forming up the men before battle and conducting a safety check on each man, making sure that they all have flints and that those flints are secure, making sure that they all have hammer stalls, that they have nothing lodged down their barrels, and that their muskets are not going to go off half-cocked. Working beneath me, I usually have one or two corporals, and to use a film analogy, if the sergeant is the director of a film, then the corporals are like assistant directors. They take care of issues that are important, but not important enough to divert the full attention of the sergeant. So they're in charge of things like making sure that each man has a full canteen and a full cartridge pouch. They're also in charge of assigning work details to keep the camp running. So for instance, making sure that the camp has enough wood for fires and buckets of water and things of that nature. They're also in charge of assigning and relieving sentries. In battle, they're positioned on the opposite end of the line from the sergeant, so you have an NCO on either end of the line. While the sergeant has the ability to become detached from the line and sort of float around as needed, the corporal's job is to stay in line with the rest of the men. He keeps an eye on them and will call out to remind them to keep their dressing should any of the men start to fall out of line. The sergeant can step in to push men back into line if need be, but ideally the corporal should be on top of it enough to stop such a thing from becoming an issue in the first place. So the corporals actually do a lot of stuff, and in a way they're sort of the backbone of the hobby, more so even than sergeants, I'd argue. I'm fond of saying that being a corporal is essentially having all of the responsibilities of rank without having any of the actual benefits. You do all of these things so that the higher-ups don't have to. Basically, the higher you advance in rank, the more abstract your duties become. In fact, when we're talking about officers in the hobby, responsibilities of rank become very abstract indeed. Whether somebody is portraying a lieutenant, a captain, a major, or higher, they're almost always performing the same administrative duties. And you don't always have multiple officers at the same event, so they all have to be able to perform the same tasks. So if we only have one officer, then they're usually positioned a few paces behind the rest of the men in the line, and they're in charge of overseeing the battlefield and making tactical decisions on the fly. They're essentially playing Empire Total War in real life while the rest of us are out playing, I don't know, Mountain Blade or something. So if a gap in the line is opening up between two units, they might tell me, the sergeant, to bring the men up and close the gap. Or if the rebels are trying to turn our flank, they might tell me to wheel the men to the left or to the right and fire on them. Or if there's an obvious weakness in the rebel lines, they might tell me to bring the men up and push it. And again, if they're the only officer present, they're doing all of this regardless of what their exact rank is. It doesn't really matter at that point. If we happen to have two officers or more at an event, then it's a little bit different. At that point, let's say if we have a captain and a lieutenant, then the captain is going to be the one making the grand tactical decisions, and the lieutenant at that point is basically going to be little more than a mouthpiece to relay those decisions to me, the sergeant. Which might make his role seem superfluous, but it's actually a smart decision, because it prevents too much strain from being placed on any one person. Probably the last thing you want at an event is to have one person in charge of absolutely everything. 
And I speak from experience when I say that, because I have been to some events where I was not only the only NCO present, but the only person on the field with any sort of rank whatsoever. And at that point, you are having to fill in for the role of corporal, sergeant, and officer all at once. And even trying to take on the role of both NCOs at once is already overwhelming enough when you aren't also in charge of making grand tactical decisions. It just doesn't work. What's important to keep in mind, however, is that, first of all, reenacting units are not a real army. And as a whole, they are a lot smaller than actual regiments in the British Army would have been, historically. An average reenacting unit has maybe anywhere from 10 to 20 people, so not even half the size of a full company, which historically would have had around 50 men. And with 10 companies in total, each regiment would have had about 500 men, with three of those companies being commanded by the colonel, lieutenant colonel, and the major, respectively, while the other seven would be commanded by a captain. And underneath them, you would also have one lieutenant and an ensign. Additionally, in a company, you would have three sergeants by 1776 and three corporals. So not only do you have a lot more people in general, but you have a lot more officers. And with those numbers comes a lot more structure. Having more officers means that there are less tasks overall that any one individual person has to take on, and you have more room to delegate specific tasks to specific people or have them alternate between specific duties as needed. And it's not just one or two people running absolutely everything all of the time. This is perhaps the most apparent when we look at the duties that historically would have been performed by corporals. When discussing the role of the corporal in reenacting, I described a whole laundry list of duties, but if we look at the role of the corporal as stated by military writer Thomas Symes, this is all he says. Corporal, an inferior position to a sergeant, posts and relieves the sentries, and while the guard is relieving, he gives the orders he received the corporal of the new guard and shows him all of the posts. He carries a firelock advanced. That's it. No specific mention of any of the other duties which I had previously described. But don't get it twisted. That's not to say that corporals were only in charge of sentry duty. It just means that corporals were the only rank to which the task of posting sentries was specifically assigned. Otherwise, their duties actually seem to overlap quite a bit with the duties of a sergeant. This is supported by Bennett Cuthbertson, another military writer of the time. At the start of Chapter 3 of his book, A System of the Complete Interior Management and Economy of a Battalion of Infantry, in regards to the qualifications necessary in sergeants and corporals, Cuthbertson says the following. Article 1. Good sergeants and corporals, being so very essential for the support of discipline, and order in a regiment, their merit must be well considered, and their qualifications impartially examined, before they are preferred to such trust. Honesty, sobriety, and a remarkable attention to every point of duty, with a neatness in their dress and a quickness of understanding above the common run of soldiers, should only recommend them. An expertness in performing every part of the exercise and an ability to teach it are absolutely necessary, nor can that sergeant or corporal be called thoroughly qualified who does not read and write in a tolerable manner. This is one of the few times in the chapter in which Cuthbertson refers to sergeants and corporals specifically by their respective ranks. Barring Article 6, which covers what should happen if a sergeant is absent due to sickness, the two ranks are afterwards collectively referred to as non-commissioned officers. No other specific distinction is made between the two ranks in regards to their duties. Later on, Cuthbertson describes the practice of forming men into squads of inspection to be examined by non-commissioned officers. This was a practice employed on the company level by which the men of the company would be divided into groups numbering seemingly anywhere from 5 to 12, depending on the strength of the regiment. Each of these squads would be overseen by either a corporal or a sergeant, and they would be charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the men of the squad were up to date on their drill and that they were taking proper care of their equipment. This makes it easier on the officers, so that they, as Cuthbertson puts it, can have all neglects and irregularities accounted for much sooner by knowing on whom at once to fix the blame than if the men were indiscriminately under the care of all of the non-commissioned officers in the company. So, in short, corporals and sergeants share a lot of the same duties when it comes to overseeing the rank and file, but they have different administrative tasks on the side. So, for corporals, as we touched on earlier, they are in charge of posting and relieving sentries. Sergeants, on the other hand, are in charge of paperwork. That's why they're expected to be literate. Pivoting back to Symes for a moment, he says that sergeants are obliged to make out many of the returns, attend morning and evening roll calls, and every day bring the orders to their officers. 
It's basically just a lot of logistical work. In addition, every company has a paymaster sergeant responsible for handling the finances of the men. On the regimental level, you also have a quartermaster sergeant and a sergeant major. The quartermaster sergeant is responsible for procuring lodgings, maintaining the barracks or the camp, and obtaining equipment necessary to keep the camp running. Things like wood for fires and straw for bedding, among other things. The sergeant major is actually a distinctive rank altogether, but you can think of him basically as like the chief sergeant that all of the other sergeants in the company report to. And he is responsible for collecting the reports submitted by those sergeants and formally recording them. Again, lots of logistical work. That's why Thomas Symes recommends, as an additional measure, appointing a sergeant to fill the role of regimental schoolmaster so that they may teach the men reading, writing, and arithmetic, skills that they will need in order to qualify them for advancement. Whew, okay, that took up a little more time than I thought it was going to. Let's move on to commissioned officers now, shall we? Starting with ensigns, Thomas Symes describes ensigns as officers that are responsible for carrying the colors. They are typically the youngest of the commissioned officers and are subordinate to the captain and the lieutenant. However, this is the American Revolution we're talking about here, and colors are not generally carried into battle just because the terrain and the method of waging battle just doesn't accommodate them very well. So the ensign's primary responsibility at that point appears to simply be to follow the example of either the lieutenant or the captain, and to lead the company in the event that both of those officers should be absent. John Williamson, author of The Element of Military Arrangement, 1781, says, When a young officer first joins his corps, he is immediately to attend the drill till he is a perfect master of both the firelock and the spontoon. He must remain at the headquarters of the regiment until he is acquainted with every particular of his duty. So, in short, a good way to describe the duties of the ensign is to think of them basically as like paid interns, essentially. It's a fast track for young officers to learn all of the ins and outs of what is both expected and required of them. Moving up the chain, we next come to the lieutenant. Symes defines the lieutenant as the second officer in a troop or company, in the absence of a captain, commands it, and is not only answerable to the service, but to him also for the care and management of it. Essentially, the lieutenant is charged with the duty of ensuring that the needs of the company are being seen to. He attends roll calls and sees that all of the men are present and accounted for. He touches base with the NCOs to see that their squads are being properly cared for. He also visits the sick and ensures that their needs are being met as well. Additionally, much like an ensign is expected to understand the duties of his superiors, so too is the lieutenant expected to understand the duties of the captain, should he be required to fill in for him. So at this point, you can probably start to see that, much like in reenacting, the individual responsibilities start to become more abstract and less clearly defined the higher up in rank you go. Captains are the overall commanders of a company, so they are expected to know their company inside and out. Much like the lieutenant, they are also expected to attend roll calls and keep tabs on the men by inspecting their arms, equipment, and uniforms once a week. Additionally, just as the lieutenant is expected to touch base with the NCOs, the captain is expected to touch base with the rest of the commissioned officers. As the overall company commander, it is important that he should be attentive in these matters, so as to ensure that he is treated with the proper amount of respect. He is also expected to understand the duties of the Major. The Major has a multitude of duties, but his primary one is to exercise the regiment under inspection of the Colonel, and ensure that all matters of discipline, military bearing, and regulations are conformed to. He also keeps the regimental books or records, and is responsible for overseeing matters pertaining to the interment of deceased officers, and handling their personal effects. And he does all of this in addition to also commanding his own company within the regiment. So in that regard, he shares the same duty as a captain. Next, we move on to the lieutenant colonel and the colonel. And again, there's a fair bit of overlap between these two. The colonel is the overall commander of an entire regiment. And so he has absolute power and the final say in regards to any executive decision made on behalf of the regiment. He has the ability to appoint non-commissioned officers and reduce them at will, as well as recommend commissioned officers for promotion. He is also in charge of providing the regiment with their clothing and has final say over any alterations made to the uniform. And again, much like the Major, he also commands his own company, at least on paper. In actuality, though, the Colonel may not be stationed in the same place as the rest of the regiment. In fact, he may not even be on the same continent. This is where the Lieutenant Colonel comes in. The lieutenant colonel performs all of the same duties as the colonel when the colonel is not present. 
However, his authority is not as far-reaching as the colonel's. The lieutenant colonel cannot, for instance, reduce NCOs at will the same way that the colonel can, nor can he recommend officers for promotion. And again, he commands his own company. You might think that he would oversee the colonel's company, but that company is distinct from the lieutenant colonel's company, and in the absence of the colonel, it is commanded by a lieutenant, filling in for the role of a captain as a captain lieutenant. So then you enter this weird world where you have people that are of one rank assuming the duties of another rank while filling in for the role of an entirely separate rank altogether. It's messy to say the least, and I've really only just scratched the surface. Advancement was a competitive process, especially when you attained the rank of captain, because once you reach captain, if the major position within your regiment is already occupied, then there's nowhere else for you to go, at least not within the regiment. So for that reason, deserving officers were sometimes offered posts not within the regiment that they were attached to, but on the army level instead. Because the army obviously has a whole host of logistical issues that require the oversight of competent individuals. So take John Andre, for example. Not only was he a major in the army who filled the role of deputy adjutant general, he was also a company captain in our very own 54th Regiment of Foot. Don Haggist has an article on Journal of the American Revolution titled Untangling British Army Ranks that explains this process in much greater detail. So if you're interested in learning more about this particular topic, I highly recommend that you check it out. I could continue further, but I think this video has gone on long enough, so I'll leave it here for now. So there you have it, a brief rundown of the duties and responsibilities of regimental field officers and NCOs in the British Army during the American Revolution. Hopefully you found this video informative and interesting. If you did, leave a like and a comment down below, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and stay tuned for future content. Until then, have a good one, take it easy, and God save the King.